You're watching Cable 2. Winston-Salem for Side County Schools Board of Education meeting. I am Deanna Kaplan, board chair, and I appreciate your attendance and also say good evening to our viewers on cable two. Will you please rise as we start the meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance and remain standing as you are able for the invocation given by board member Susan Miller. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of Let us pray. Dear Lord, enlighten our minds to the ways that we can best serve those we are entrusted to educate and form. Bless our conversations with goodwill, sincerity, and truth. Amen. Thank you, Board Member Miller. Our first order of business tonight is the agenda review. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda as written? Do I have a second? So I have, a, I have a motion by Board Member Kuhn, a second by Board Member Crowley. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Thank you, that is unanimous. Our next order of business tonight is our student performance. Please welcome the Reagan Theater.
Colts. Yeah, wow is a very good word <laughs> to describe that. That was awesome. Um, our next order of business is special recognitions. First, Andrew Kraft, our Director of Arts Education and Summer Programming, will recognize the exceptional talent and award presented to Mimi Emmerich from the Mount Tabor Theater as the winner of the Thespian Award Best Monologue Performance and Critics' Choice. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, Distinguished Board, Superintendent McManus. Uh, on March 2nd, Mimi Emmerich, uh, you can come on out, Mimi. Um, go ahead and come on down. Uh, a student at Mount Tabor High School received a superior ranking for her monologue performance at the 2024 North Carolina State International Thespian Society Conference held at East Carolina University. Her <laughs> Her exceptional talent distinguished her as the top performer among all female competitors. As a result, she earned the honor of representing North Carolina at the International Thespian Society Conference at Indiana University in June. And so her teacher, uh, Mr. Incom Baker, is here with her tonight, as well as her father. So let's please recognize Mimi here. Next, Dr. Carol Montague Davis, the chair of the Winston-Salem Forsyth County Schools Education Foundation, will announce the awards to the inaugural Winston-Salem Forsyth County Schools Education Grant recipients.
Good evening. What a great night to come. You know, the theater group from Reagan remind me of when I was in the principal of high school. It was really enjoyable. It didn't make me want to come out of retirement, though, but it did help me enjoy the event. So, um, good evening, Chairman um, Kaplan, Superintendent McManus, board members. Thank you so much for giving the Winston-Salem Forsyth County School Educational Foundation the opportunity to present tonight the inaugural grant cycle winners. I am Dr. Carol Montague Davis, the new chairman of the board, replacing Daniel Jones, who resigned. The Winston-Salem Forsyth County Educational Foundation was created in March of 2023 with a mission to enhance student learning and achievement by securing financial support and other resources for Winston-Salem Forsyth County School. Well, tonight, we want to say that we are here to recognize the winner of our first grant cycle. Yay! <laughs> the first grant cycle opened on January the 1st and ended February the 15th. We had a total of 32 grant applications, 17 elementary schools, nine six, six middle schools, and nine high schools. The grant committee was breaking down in awards. Uh, we had eight elementary schools awards that totaled $7,222.85. We had two middle school awards that totaled $1,722. And we had six high school awards that totaled $5,769.13. So we're granting tonight an award total of $14,700. $13.98. Yeah, we did it to the penny. <laughs> now, um, Tommy taught me that. Now I would like to invite <laughs> Donald Dunn up, the chairperson of the grant committee, to assist with awarding the checks and the certificates. Good evening. Um, it was my huge honor to chair this particular committee. It was made up of four people, including my total of five people, including myself from the community. None of them had any relationship to the school system. They were just community leaders and volunteers. When we received the applications, they were all blank. We didn't know who they were from. All we had was the description of the um, project they wanted to do and the dollar amount. And the committee got together and we just came up with the total and then we are going to award these people tonight. Unlike earlier with the performance of the scholars that were on stage, we're bringing together the next big group of people in our school system that make a huge difference. So if all the educator and administrators will come out, please. First recipient is um, Theodore Barton, Barton from Early College. His project title was Providing an Alternative Woodworking, Woodworking for a Whole Child, for a Whole, for a whole Student. Our next recipient is Chandler, um, Jessica? Gina. Gina Chandler from Louisville Elementary. She, um, her and, and Theodore both received $1,000. Hers was to update the computers for her um, class and entire school. Our next one is Jessica Edgerton from Union Cross. <laughs> Jennifer, I'm sorry, Jennifer. I thought it was peanut butter, but that's all right. <laughs> and her, from Union Cross and her, um, dual language books that she's going to provide for $963.50. Since Carol's keeping me to the penny. Who? Okay. All right. Um, our next one is Betty Ann Ferg. From Walkertown High. She's receiving $928.54. <laughs> okay. 
and um, hers was engaging students with learning disabilities. Both her administrator, um, Missy Walker, and her vice principal are both here. <laughs> Erica Gray from Clemens Middle. Her principal is Sandy Hunter, and hers is M Mago Morning. And what? MAGA, MAGA morning, $730. Okay, Amanda, May, help me, Amanda. Malathian, thank you, Amanda. And hers was making math come alive, integrating real world data into mathematics. And it was $970.59. Next is Sandy, Sarah, I'm all sorry, Sarah, help me again. Madrano. Madrano, thank you, Sarah, from um, Paisley IB Magnet. And hers is engaging all learners, $992. <laughs> Robert Powell, Cook Elementary. His principal trivet is here. And he got nine, ooh, excuse me, a thousand dollars. All this money given away kind of got me excited. Excuse me, Robert. Um, um, Literacy Garden is what he's going to create with his project. Jeff Rogers, Atkins High. His AP is here. Evan, uh, um, Ev Evans. Um, student, go student gaming, design, co competition, and expo, $1,000. <laughs> Townsend is next. She is from Gibson, and hers is um, school garden learning um, kiosk, $914. $9, $900. $914.85. And our last recipient is um, Kimberly Spees from Mount Tabor. She will receive $1,000 and they're going to do a field trip to um, about career exploration and marketing. So did I miss anybody? Is she here? Yes. Catherine Garris from Kimberly Park. <laughs> Books for all of our kindergarten students for We want to thank you again for applying. And all the administrators, we thank you for coming out tonight. We know sometimes that you give up that um, obligation for coming here to support your teachers. So the ones that we miss, we want to make sure that we call your name as well. So if you could stand out so we can just make sure. I can see the old ladies getting a little dim. There you go. Kia. Jameer. OK. But thank you so much for coming. Um, the next grant cycle will open on May the 1st, and this is an enrichment grant cycle. April 1st. April 1st. Thank you. No, May 1st. Oh, close on May 1st. Open April the 1st, I told you. Um, the next cycle is opens on April the 1st and closes on May 1st. It's an enrichment cycle, and the cycle is focused on unique opportunities and experiences for teachers and students. So this is one that you can um, apply for your school, or a student can apply if a student wanted to do an enrichment opportunity during the summer and might not have the funds to do so, encourage them to um, apply for the grant. If you want to do some enrichment activities within your building for the summer, you can apply as a school grant. One thing about it, though, you as an individual have to miss a cycle 
So you can apply for this cycle as an individual, okay? All right, so, and we have activities such as field, grip, field trips, art programs, and cultural excursions are eligible for funding. We have $20,000 um, $20, to give away in the cycle too. Um, so in closing, I'd like to, Winston like to thank the Winston-Salem Board of Ed members for, um, for letting us be in here tonight to, talk, um, to present our awards. And also, I would like for the Winston-Salem Forsyth County Educational Foundation Board to please stand so you can see who's working behind the scenes. <laughs> we are small and mighty, and it's all volunteer work. It's about eight of us, but we are champions for education. And we know what goes on in the classroom is important every day. And the one that makes a difference for a child is the person who's standing in front of them every day. And so we are here to support you in doing those type of things if you have a way that we can. So again, in closing, I thank you so much for volunteering your service and bringing the champion of education. Congratulations to the winners. And thank you again for allowing us to showcase the first winners for our Educational Foundational Grant recipients. Absolutely. Thank the Educational uh, Foundation Board for all their work. This is a, a tremendous gift to our teachers, and it's a legacy that I think we will all be proud of as we keep having more grant cycles and more money going back to, um, to our staff and students. So thank you, Educational Foundation Board. Yes. And how about one more round of applaud. applause for the board, <laughs> the Education Foundation. And our next order is uh, the board spotlight video. March is Women's History Month, and WSFCS has celebrated by honoring some important female figures. Gibson Elementary School displayed meaningful quotes from some of the most famous women in the world, past and present, in their What She Said exhibit. The primary goal was to inspire and motivate students through the words of these influential women. The display featured quotes from Oprah Winfrey, Eleanor Roosevelt, Rosa Parks, Sally Ride, Harriet Tubman, and many more. We Winston-Salem native Diane Faison performed her one-woman show, The Spirit of Harriet Tubman, for eighth grade students at Northwest Middle School. He come down there, he was hot. Before I go on with each performance, I meditate and I ask Harriet's spirit to come to me. I feel as though I am Harriet's vessel, so I, I just become Harriet. Ms. Faison, a retired teacher of 30 years, has performed as Harriet Tubman over 400 times. She started in 1988 when she greeted her class on a Monday morning at the door as the famous political activist. I never learned how to read nor write. 
Tubman herself was born into slavery in 1822. Once free, she dedicated her life to the abolition of slavery as a conductor on the Underground Railroad, freeing more than 70 enslaved people in the process. It's an emotional performance that's full of lessons and determination. I want to be free! I want to be free! Ms. Faison feels this American history, although it occurred close to 200 years ago, is still relevant information for the younger generation. To me, it's like building a house. If you don't have the foundation to build on, you don't know which way to go. It doesn't matter whether it is black, white, civil rights. It's any human beings that their rights are being abused. And by knowing history, you can build a future. By having that foundation, you can build that house, the future. Smith Farm Elementary School recently hosted a multicultural night. Every class represented a different country that the students researched and learned about. The families got to travel the world as they went from class to class learning about different cultures. So the goal of our multicultural event is to uh, make our students global citizens. We want them to learn about other parts of the world so that they can take that knowledge and it can help them later in life. They work really, really hard on every project you see hanging in our school. The night also featured artwork from students based on their country. We make a world of difference every single day. We are creating experiences for our children that they probably don't get in their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, we are exposing them to all sorts of new possibilities so that they know that whatever they can imagine, whatever they want to try and accomplish, it is limitless. This morning is a reminder that there are good people in this world. In March, Meadowlark Middle School held Ben Miller Day in honor of a former seventh grader who passed away from heart disease in 2002. Since then, the school has been honoring him annually. Ben was a huge UNC Tar Heel basketball fan, so every year at the start of the ACC Men's Basketball Tournament, students and staff wear their favorite ACC gear and donate at least a dollar to the American Heart Association in Ben's name. This year, Metal Ark raised over $900, a new school record. The kids know that whichever team has the most students sitting in their section and gets donuts, and so we always see Carolina have the most, have the most uh, kids with that color on. You know, as sad as it is to lose a child like that, it's you know, fun to have some fun around remembering him. I think he'd like the fact that it's a fun event, so it's really all about him and his legacy. It touches my heart every year when this happens, and I usually get emotional <laughs> at ACC Day. I just love that they remember him in such a special way and that they contribute to the Heart Association, which is a great organization that hopefully can help someone else out someday. The experiences our students will get in this lab are going to truly prepare them for the future. The excitement could be felt at Winston-Salem Preparatory Academy as the latest Verizon Innovative Learning Lab was unveiled. The lab is made possible through a partnership with Heart of America, the J. Oren Edson Entrepreneurship, the Innovation Institute at Arizona State University, and Verizon. The new lab gives students and teachers access to emerging technologies such as augmented and virtual reality, 3D printing, and artificial intelligence. This Verizon Innovative Learning Lab is the third such lab in our district. In our district, we focus a lot on deeper learning, and that is exactly what deeper learning is. It's more than just reading a textbook and being able to regurgitate information. This is giving the kids a chance to be innovative and to create and collaborate and to, to really engage in a lot of the tech tools that are available today, and then to also help them to understand that tech is always evolving, so they will be able to see and be able to adapt to the change in the new tech tools that come out later. <laughs> Students need people they can look up to, someone who inspires and encourages them on their journey to adulthood. That is exactly what a group of men brought to the students at East Forsyth High School. Today was what we call the 100 Men Challenge for Eagle Nation, and the whole goal was to bring out men from our community, parents, former uh, colleagues, retired people, just whoever was willing to come out. Uh, and welcome our kids to campus today. It's going to be a great day. They're going to be influenced by somebody. Um, it might as well be us. They are the next generation. They are the ones that are going to wind up being our leaders. They're going to be our, our church leaders, our business leaders, uh, law enforcement. 
fire department. Um, they also have the potential to, to go the other way and make bad impacts. So we just want to make sure that we do what we can to help make sure they uh, they follow the right road and do everything they can to help benefit the community. It really brings a smile to my heart to see just adults coming out to bringing kids, just saying good morning to them because that could literally change their whole day because you never know what that person is going through. So just saying a good morning, I hope you have a great day can just change somebody's day. They're the future. Um, so, so we've got to pour into them because I mean we're only here for so long and these kids are following behind us so somebody's got to kind of lead the example and set the foundation. I'm going to have to get y'all to come once a week. To know that the kids feel the love, to know that our teachers feel the love and the support, that's what matters most. And that is a look at this month's Board of Education Spotlight. Thank you. Yeah, that was great and award winning. <laughs> At this time, excuse me, we will hear public comments on the agenda items only. We have two speakers today. Remember to be kind, considerate, and respectful, and direct your comments only to me as board chair and not to anyone in the audience. And no, we cannot talk about sensitive and private student or personnel information in this public setting. And you have three minutes. Our first speaker is Tiffany Drew. Um, good evening, Chairwoman Kaplan, Vice Chair Bohannon, Superintendent McManus, and Board. Um, I'm here to speak about the Fostering Diverse Schools Grant and modernizing the residential boundaries and um, choice zones. I think it's a wonderful idea to increase socioeconomic diversity in our schools for several reasons. It promotes understanding and empathy, prepares students for real-world diversity, and helps reduce stereotypes and prejudices. In our ever polarizing society, it is important to embrace every chance possible to get to know and understand each other better. We are setting our students up for success by creating an inclusive environment where they can collaborate with students of different backgrounds and be exposed to experiences and viewpoints outside their own. As a district, there is a focus on creating well-rounded, future-ready students. And I believe that modernizing the residential boundaries and zone choices is a great step towards accomplishing that goal. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Katie Sonnen Lee. Hello, board and superintendent. My name is Katie Sonnen Lee. I'm the vice president of Action for, a Action for Equity, and I have been for six years now. Action for Equity first started as Action for Ashley, and I know the Ashley um, design plan is on the agenda for tonight, so I wanted to speak about that. Um, it's a step in the right direction to get a design plan together for Ashley, but we know it's not enough. Um, it's been more than six years since Action for Ashley began advocating for a new school in light of the mold and environmental problems and concerns at Ashley Elementary, and we still don't have a new school. We don't even have money for a new school. Um, $900,000 for a plan is great, but even in the board slides that were in the agenda, there's not a whole lot of information there. We need to move this forward. We have much more to do. Again, this is a right step, but we've got much more to do, and it needs to happen more quickly than six years to get a plan in place, a uh, design plan in place. In 2022, Action for Equity held community meetings and canvassed residents in the area to ask them what they wanted in a new Ashley Elementary for their neighborhood. Ashley is one of those schools that is a pride of the neighborhood. People talk about, I went there, my cousins went there. My mom went there. Um, it's, a really great it's a really great experience to talk to Ashley residents who live in the Ashley area about what the school means to them and their community. So we did that. We went, we had community meetings. We went door to door, knocking on doors, asked so we could have conversations with people. We didn't just do a survey, although we did do a survey as well. But, you know, it's really about building relationships with the community. And that's what we did. And that's what you have in your board packet about the Ashley Dream Report that you see. That was created by Action for Equity through several, several weeks and months of meetings with community to get their input. And we want to encourage the district to continue to listen to the community in this process. Don't just have the report. It goes on a shelf. That was something they poured their hearts and souls in. I mean, those meetings were incredible to be in if you're, um, if you're somebody who attended them. We also encourage the district to act quickly to find funding for a new school, something the community has been asking for for more than a decade. Um, we know probably the way that it usually works is we wait for a bond to come up. We don't have time to wait for a 2028 or 2030 bond to come. And then, you know, we still have projects from 2016 bond that aren't done yet. 
it's eight years on, and we probably have a couple more years on some of those. We don't have time for that. We need the district to move quickly to do the right thing for equity and for our community and for our kids, because that's really what's at the center of this. Um, so whether that's a bond in 2026, something sooner, whatever it is, we ask that you please move forward on that. Um, in my 20 seconds I have left, <laughs> I also wanted to say that we are excited to see the fostering socioeconomic diversity um, stuff that uh, Ms. McMillan's gonna present on later. Um, and that it's a really, we need to diversify our schools and our, and our districting, our zoning in every way, racially, socioeconomic. And then third, I wanted to say that I really love having the student art in here. That's a really nice change, and I think we should always do this. And shout out to, on, on the record, Jose Zaragoza for the Taylor Swift art. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, our next order of business is discussion items. And first of all, we have Lauren Richards, our Chief Operations Officer, and she will update us on the Enhanced Stop Arm Grant. Good evening, board um, chair Kaplan, board members, and Superintendent McManus. I am here this evening on behalf of Tisha Davidson, our senior executive director of transportation, to share with you that we recently applied for um, two grants through North Carolina Department of Public Instruction for some enhanced equipment for our school buses. And so that first grant um, is for $4,000 for stop arm cameras. Um, we currently have 70 buses that have stop arm cameras, and with this $4,000, we will be able to add four additional cameras. You can see from the pictures um, on these slides that this allows us to take video um, when we unfortunately maybe have a violation in our community so that we can report those violations to law enforcement and keep our students safe as they board school buses. The second allotment um, is just shy of 18,000, and this is for enhanced technology on school buses. Um, NCDPI gives school districts two options um, for spending these funds. Those two options, um, the first one in that top picture being the illuminated stop arm, and the second option being an extended stop arm on the school bus. And so we do currently have both um, on some of our buses. We have one illuminated stop arm, and we have 25 of the extended stop arms um, in the district. And so as staff was looking at what direction we wanted to go with this equipment for these grant funds, um, we put together some upsides and downsides um, of the two different pieces of equipment. Um, one of the things I didn't mention on the previous slide is that in new yellow bus purchases, um, the Department of Public Instruction is making it standard for the illuminated stop arm um, as they issue new buses to school districts. And so as we looked through that with only having one of those on um, one of our current school buses, we are looking to do eight additional um, illuminated stop arms um, and test those out and see how they go. We think that will be a great help for our early start schools um, and our bus routes that run a little bit later in the evening in the dark and so that all of our um, cars in the community can see that very clearly. And so any questions about those allotments that you have for appropriation tonight? Any questions? Okay, thank you. Next, Dr. Effie McMillan, our Chief Equity Officer, will lead us in a discussion of fostering socioeconomic diversity. Good evening, Board Chair Kaplan, Vice Chair Bohannon, Superintendent McManus, and the esteemed board. Um, I'm here with uh, my colleague, Frank Pantana, who is the Executive Director of Choice and Magnet Schools, did I get that right? We're actually co-leading this project together and we're excited about the work that we've embarked on. Um, and so we're gonna, we're gonna tag team, but we wanna start just at the beginning to just remind the board, um, but also to remind our community or introduce to some of our community that may have not been following along that we did win a competitive grant. Um, it was awarded to us about mid-October um, around fostering economically diverse schools. Uh, we were one of about 12 districts across the country that received a two-year planning grant. So we're well on our way into the work. As a part of some of our initial learning, what we're updating you on is tonight is to give you an overview of the work we've been doing, but also our findings thus far, and then to end with our next steps. 
So when we look at the makeup of our schools, um, as you can see here on the screen, the economic diversity with across our schools, we have 24 schools um, or roughly 30% of the district's total schools that are economically diverse, which means they have a balance of ranges of incomes um, within that school demographics. We have 23 schools, um, about 29% that share, have a share of economically disadvantaged students that is more than 10% below the district's average. And then we have 32 schools, or about 40%, that have a share of economically disadvantaged students that is more than 10% above the district's average. What all that tells us is that the majority of our schools, nearly 70%, are socioeconomically segregated. So, that gives you one of the reasons why we pursued this grant, um, in addition to uh, the fact that um, really a comprehensive look and reimagining of our residential boundaries has not been done in approximately 30 years. So this funding really gives us the opportunity to do some mapping work and to engage our community around what they um, want um, so that this can really be a community-driven process to reimagine what our school district looks like when we're thinking about our residential attendance zones. We also pursued this grant to align with our policy 5117, which is the assignment of pupils. So I did pull out some language from that policy, which you can see with letter B, which is letter B actually in the policy, um, of really the work of this board um, in our district to create a diverse and inclusive student body to maximize racial and socioeconomic integration, um, and to preserve, expand, and replicate successful programs across the entire district to increase equitable access to quality instructional models for all of our students. So there's lots of research out there. Um, there's lots of research that talks about the disadvantages for students who attend schools that have high concentrations of poverty. There's also lots of research out there that talks about the benefits of students um, participating, attending, and engaging in schools that are socioeconomically diverse. So that's what we're focusing on and what are the benefits. So if you notice on the screen, there are quite a few benefits. I won't read all of them, uh, but some of the ones that really do stand out is the stronger academic outcomes um, than students who are attending schools with concentrated poverty more likely to enroll in a four-year college. So when we think about post-secondary opportunities, um, it really can set the stage for um, those opportunities later on. Future ready, life ready is what we want for our, want for our students. Dropout rates are significantly impacted um, and it reduces disparities um, in access to well-maintained facilities, highly qualified teachers and challenging courses. So this is just a few benefits. There are many others. Um, and so those are just some of the ones that we wanted to highlight for tonight. So really here's what our deliverables are before I turn it over to Frank, um, is that we do want stakeholder vetted models. When we talk about stakeholders, we're gonna be engaging with students, parents, um, and staff members around this work to really, in, to really have an honest conversation and dialogue um, and to give them an opportunity to look at what the possibilities are um, and how we move forward as a district after the two-year planning phase ends so that we have maps to present to the board that will give you an opportunity to vote on what our next steps are so that we can move forward with implementation. And so we are in phase one, or really wrapping up phase one, which is the exploration and modeling, which is the data that has already been presented to you um, to really understand what our landscape is. So I'm gonna turn it over to Frank now because he's gonna dig in a little bit more and share some maps and data um, that supports those initial statements that I made at the beginning of the presentation. Thank you, Dr. McMillan. Hello, everybody. Um, so yeah, we talked about exploration in phase one and how we're wrapping that up. So we'll show you some of the things that we found while we explored with the current landscape. Um, kind of did this as a Q&A. Um, first question, how much do residential boundaries matter in light of choice and magnet options. So one of the things that came up as we were looking at this is if we change the boundaries, but if people can just go to different schools whenever, is it gonna make any effect? And what we found is that the boundaries actually matter a great deal. Following slides will show you some enrollment data. So if you look at, this is high school. 
Um, 70% of high schoolers attend their residential school, so the vast majority. Um, if you talk about Choice and Magnet, only about 12%, so I'm executive director of Choice and Magnet. I love our Choice and Magnet programs. They're, they're great for our, our families to make choices. But it's only about 12% that actively apply to go to a different high school. Um, that 17% is an other. Um, that includes students that have moved. Um, they may be moved across the district, but we still let them continue going to their current school. Um, they could have sibling preference or pathway preference or employee preference. So again, the, the main point is that mostly in the residential schools, we see the same numbers across middle schools, 68%. Um, again, around 11 to 12% um, for choice and magnet. And again, in elementary school, we see again, 68%. Um, a little less on that choice of magnet, maybe we'll get, get those numbers up. That's a separate discussion. <laughs> so um, so that's, that's one question um, kind of asked and answered. So the next one is, how socioeconomically diverse are our current residential boundaries? Um, Dr. McWillan spoke to this a, a little bit already, but the answer is that um, those boundaries are not very socioeconomically diverse as they stand. The following slides are going to show some median income by the current residential boundaries. So here's high school. Um, Lots of numbers on here that you can look at, but also it's just some color. So green is for money, right? The darker green, the more money. Um, the lighter, the less. So you can kind of see in high school, we have that um, center of our district and sort of southeast. And you see a similar pattern again in your middle school residential boundaries. And again, in your elementary school residential boundaries. And just to make sure that we're giving you all the information, all the numbers are on there as well as exactly what the median incomes are at the different schools. You can see there's quite a span. If you look at middle school, we have a, um, one school with a median of 22,000 and another one with 104,000. So there's a huge range, um, range there between the schools. Um, see something similar with all the elementary schools. So just to sort of summarize our key findings that we had as we explored this, this data, um, we found that the majority of our students do attend their residential school. Um, we also found that our residential boundaries have not been overhauled in 30 plus years. And there's transportation inefficiencies that have cropped up over that time. Um, the boundaries are not socioeconomically diverse or balanced. And the boundaries can be modernized to increase both transportation efficiency and socioeconomic diversity. So we can have a win-win. Next steps, I'm gonna pass back to Dr. McMillan. Thank you. So just for next steps, um, for this two-year planning process is for broken into four phases. So as Frank just mentioned, we're really at the end of the exploration and modeling phase, and modeling meaning current map structure, current landscape structure. Um, so now we're getting ready to move into the phase of engaging with members of our community. And so when I say members of our community, I want to just emphasize that it will be students, it will be parents, caregivers, guardians, and it will also be staff. And so we do have a very ambitious goal of engaging with um, about 8,000 people is our goal. Um, so pretty ambitious. And so we're working on that plan right now. We plan to launch with our first group of students in April after we return from spring break. It will continue over the summer. Um, we are, have already started reaching out to some of our community partners that have summer programs and um, other ways that they engage families, events, and all those types of things so that we know where things are happening so that we can plan to engage families where they are versus asking them to come to us. Uh, we will be going to students and the same thing for staff, we're going to be providing opportunities for them. And so it's going to be some creative problem solving for that, some in person, some hybrid virtual options, um, and then some other ways that we want to engage. We have already been convening with the steering committee. I think we've had four or five meetings. Um, we have been meeting almost monthly. And each month we've been digging a little bit more and more into some of this data. Um, and they have been instrumental and in also giving feedback of all the things we need to consider. Um, as we're planning to move into the second phase of stakeholder engagement. Um, our next full board update will be on June 11th. Um, at that time, what we're anticipating or planning for is that we will have engaged with a number of people um, and we'll have quite a bit of the, the starting points of quite a bit of feedback from our community. We want to bring that uh, information back to you. 
Uh, we'll synthesize and look for trends, patterns, and, and those types of things. And then we are also working with um, a mapping specialist. And so we want to have them to begin looking at these boundaries that Frank was just talking about of how we can begin to balance them and what those possibilities could look like, but infusing the community voice in that to really help shape, shape that. So we don't wanna do one without the other. It really will be an integration of both pieces. Um, so we will come back June 11th with some of the initial findings and things to present to you. Um, and so are there any questions? Board Member Coon? Oh, I'm sorry, you thought you had a question. I'm sorry. <laughs> Board Member Watts. Well, first of all, say thank you to both of you for the work that you're putting forth in, in leading these efforts. Uh, when, I, when, I'm, when I do make the committee meetings, um, they're always very energetic, creative, hands-on, with data-driven. So thank you for how you're conducting the meetings. And also, I want to also commend you for looking for trying to find those parents and community givers that are traditionally not touched by our school system because I think we need to try to really engage all of our parents and all of our caregivers and I know both of you have that passion so I look forward to seeing the mechanisms that you're going to use to make it happen. You might need to go back to the Census Bureau and say we're going to knock on these doors but, um, but I know you've got all that in planning so thank you for what you've done so far to move this forward. Any other? Yes, Board Member Crowley. Um, yes, thank you for all the work that um, this group has been doing. I've enjoyed being a, a part of it. Um, in looking at the research findings on the points that were presented up here, um, including academic achievement and facilities equity, how do our 24 economically diverse schools compare? Do you want to speak to that one? Yeah, there's one thing to say, this is what the research shows. Well, if we're saying 24 of ours are economically diverse, how do they actually measure up? So that is a great question. I would have to dig a little deeper to make sure that I could give a, a full answer. But what I can say is that um, anecdotally, as we were looking at those schools, those are some of our highest performing schools. Um, I know that during steering committee meetings, we would pull those out. We're like, well, where's it being done right? And then we'd look and we'd see a school name and okay, all of a sudden that's one of our schools with, with a higher letter grade or something like that. So, so I would say um, I'd wanna look at the data, give a, a more complete answer, but um, first glance, it looks like we, we do mirror those same, same findings here in our district. Okay, I'd like to see the data because I, mm -hmm. I don't see where we do mirror on a lot of these, so okay. Which, can, Really quickly, so we capture that. What, what data points, you, what, what are the data points you'd like to see? Do you, on the side. Go back. Do you All the things that the, said the research the did. Yeah. I'm just saying if we have a school that I'll is, sure. yeah. no, so I'm we have 24 schools that are economically diverse, mm -hmm. are they achieving those points that were on that slide? So one of the things that we had debated mm -hmm. about bringing was performance grades. Uh -huh that were that's attached to all the schools. Well, and I think, Board Member Crowley, I think yeah. that's what you're asking for. Well, and also about the facilities equity. Yeah, so we can over, we can definitely overlay that information to see where okay. we stack yeah. up with what national research says. Right. Um, in relation to that. Yeah, okay. we can definitely do that. Okay. So. Yes, Vice Chair Bohannon. So, it, to me, it seems like it might be a little bit of a, like, Although, if you we're regarding these bullet points on the slide where it says, what does research say about socioeconomic, diver, economically diverse schools? So I don't necessarily need like how our schools stack up with each of those. I feel like that's a, that's a tall order. But I think that right now, even though I'll just say, we all know that the school perform, there are problems with the school performance grade and the composition and all of those things, but it's what we have right this minute. So I would just like, if you could please, to provide the board with, the performance grades for those schools that are considered to be socioeconomically diverse. Um, and then the other question I had, and this is, this is more of a, for my own kind of information. So the charts that were included in the item, the, the middle school, elementary school, and high school, like the chart, the really cool charts that sort of showed, like they're not in this PowerPoint, they're in the, the item um, that showed the, the amount of students that are residential and then kind of crossed, if I could get that, if I could get the current capacity for each school, I'd love to see this 
like with capacity, like what the actual number is for capacity, because I think it'd be interesting just to see the variation. So mm -hmm. if I could get that, that would be great. And even if you want to just provide me what the capacities are, I can just do it myself. We'll, we'll, we'll do it okay. for you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we will, we'll make it easy for you. So you want capacity for each of the schools. Okay. So I think we can just put both things together, the performance grade. I think it will be helpful, uh, not just for the 24 schools, but also to see those Everybody's. performance grades of our schools that have high concentrations of poverty, um, because it is a very telling story when you look at the two. So for me to say all 24, I don't wanna be misleading with that. So to Frank's point, we do wanna be accurate with that, but there is definitely a difference that we see from schools that have high concentrations of poverty based on performance grades that the state assigns. Um, and I do that in air quotes because unfortunately, that performance score does not really paint the true picture of what's happening within those buildings. And I guess uh, my point is, is that schools that have high concentrations of wealth tend to meet that list of, um, the, of, of positive attributes. They're not necessarily diverse. They have high concentrations of wealth. So that's, I'm not sure that, that I just want to see what our, what mm -hmm. we, the schools that we say are economically diverse, mm -hmm. what are they actually scoring? Because I know mm -hmm. that list absolutely applies to our schools where there's a lot of wealth. Mm -hmm. I'm not convinced it applies to our list of economically diverse schools. So we can definitely get you that, but I will speak to the piece of high concentrations of, of wealth. So with high concentrations of wealth, you are going to oftentimes see higher performance grades because there's always already access and opportunity there. What happens when we begin to create inclusive and integrative schools, it also creates greater access and opportunity from students that, for students that are furthest away from opportunity that does not have that same access and opportunity within their schools. So that is a distinguishing factor when you think about full wealth versus full poverty versus a, a mixture, a balanced mixture uh, of what it can offer and expose um, and provide for students who come from underserved, historically underserved school uh, communities, yeah. may never have access to um, if they don't have points of, points of interest to engage with students um, that are outside of what their known experience is. So I think it's multifaceted, but that's, that's one of the key pieces of that. So, and just to follow up on Dr. McLean's point, so there are really two different types of data here, if you look, so like the first four the first three are about those academic standards that we're talking about. But then if you talk, look at a racial, racial achievement gap closing more rapidly, if you have uh, different concentrations, you may not see that. Um, same thing with uh, environments promoting creativity, motivation, deeper learning, reducing disparities, and then of course learning skills that prepare them to navigate increasingly diverse societies. So there's kind of two pieces. One is more qualitative and one is more quantitative. So of course we can provide that quantitative data for you, but there is another side to that coin as well that I want to bring up. Board member Coon. I think it's important to, and, and you may not, and it's okay if you don't have the answer right now, but I think it's important to um, to name who, who the district considers are, quote, economically diverse schools, um, because that is a, that's a, a, a tall order when we think about our, um, our community, because if we yep. look at our community as essentially 33, 33, 33, and if we're looking, if we take out the economic piece of it and we're looking at socioeconomic, um, we don't have many schools that make up that. Does that, am I making yeah. sense? So I think it's really hard to measure what you're looking for when we don't necessarily have many schools that even meet that to begin with. So do we even have schools to meet it to begin with? So I'll say um, these maps we do. show that to some extent. And I thought, um, and I also missed an opportunity to give a shout out to um, Rachel Midge, who is our new GIS coordinator who created these maps for us. She, she's new to our team. Um, but I did want to say that if you look at these colors, um, the really light ones would show you where there's concentrations of poverty. The really dark ones would show you where there's concentrations of wealth. 
and the in-between might show you the more socioeconomic. Um, so, so there is some of that, and, and that's, that's going to be across um, all those different levels. Now, there's other issues with like rural versus city and all this different stuff that might show up in these as well, but, but we do have some of that shown in the, um, so, shown in the maps. Vice Chair Bohannon. Um, you go ahead. I'm sorry. You go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. What I was going to say, it might help when you get to the chart that they're discussing. If you could highlight maybe the 24 schools that we're saying that are um, economically diverse, mm -hmm. one highlight, and then the other highlight would be the 23 schools that, so I'm not giving you colors, graph. but I'm just saying that we could pick up quickly which ones we are considering. Better. That's a good idea. Yeah, on, we can do that. On, uh, yeah. on the graph, is that? On, no, graph on the no. chart. On the spreadsheet. Oh, on the spreadsheet. Chart. Right, yes. that you also okay. wanted to add what was the capacity in that spreadsheet. You, okay. So we could see it real quickly. Okay. Mm -hmm. So my, the, the other question I had, so there are parts of the PowerPoint in the presentation that refer to, like these, these charts say, are referring to economic diversity, like that said explicitly, but there's the parts of the PowerPoint that talk about socioeconomic diversity. So I think that a good, I, I'd like to know a little bit more about, so the, I know that research talks about the benefit of socioeconomic diverse schools, but economic diversity is easier to quantify than the socioeconomic pieces. So I guess definitively I'd like for, what are we, what is our, what is our working definition of socioeconomic diversity? So we're, we, it might be some type of formula between like the economic pieces and then some of the more social determinants. I don't know how we get that data or what that is, but I think if we're, if, if that's the where, if that's what we're working with, if we're going with socioeconomic diversity, then I think that we have to, th that's a little unclear about what we're, what the definition of that is. Okay. So that is a really good point, and I think we have been using it interchangeably. Okay. Um, but as we delve into this work and we look at our communities that have been redlined, um, they are definitely under-resourced. Under we cannot do this work without taking into consideration the social context and factors that also impact the children that come from those communities um, and that are part of our schools. So. That is definitely a part of the work. Um, we definitely can quantify economic diversity, and those are the numbers that we've been running. Um, but as we engage with our communities um, and in thinking about what residential boundaries shift, that is a context that we definitely have to keep in mind um, because that does have implications for decisions that are made of how the district moves forward. So I know that didn't necessarily give you a definition, but hopefully that helps to clarify a little bit of uh, just some of the conversations that we're having um, as we are looking at not only just the, because what's really interesting is here that that it doesn't always mirror other uh, urban areas uh, with census, census, census tracts or zip codes is that you may have a zip code where this is just the income level in that zip code. But here in Winston, we have a range that may be across one zip code that may go from a million dollars to $25,000 all within just one area. Um, and so there's some nuances to how we have to look at our data, look at income levels, ranges, and all of that. That is um, some of what we're grappling with as we're in this initial phase to really understand the context and landscape of our entire community. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, just right here. I just want to make a comment. You know, and I've said this before, I think in committee meeting, and I may have said it publicly, but we just need to make sure in this process that we do our due diligence to get all of the vital stakeholders around the mm -hmm. table, because as we know, we have, um, well, San Forsyth County School has done something for, for 30 years that a lot of parents um, at least when it started, liked, and maybe some parents now still like. We just need to make sure that we do our due diligence and we get buy-in from all sectors of our community because mm -hmm. we want to bring people together. Mm -hmm. And if we don't, if we don't move in this, I guess with wisdom and with thought and with plan and with diligence, you know, it could be real problematic. Which I think we understand as a board. Yeah. Thank you for lifting that up again, um, Board Member Barr. Um, as 
was stated in the committee meeting, I'll say it just so the public can also hear it, is that um, going after a two-year planning grant was intentional so that we would have be able to invest a bulk of the time to how we really engage with community around this work because it has been a long time um, and there's been lots of conversations even since I've been here in the district that have started and stopped um, and still really have not moved anywhere. So I think as an internal team, some um, people are not here like Homan, whom all of you, whom all of you know um, has been doing this work for a very, very long time. So leaning on the expertise of people who've been in the weeds of it um, is really vital. And we wanna take our time and move slow to make sure that we do capture every sector of our community. So thank you for raising you. that. And I just yeah. want to reiterate that point, that that is a very much an intent of this process. Right. Because we know whenever you do some major endeavor, the most important part, again, is getting those critical stakeholders around the table mm -hmm. and making sure everyone has buy-in, all yes. communities. So thank you. Absolutely. Yep. Yes, uh, Board Member Wood. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, great questions all around, but I've got one okay. question for you, Frank, on the presentation that you made a few minutes ago. Yes. You indicated in your research uh, findings you counted transportation inefficiencies. Can yes. you uh, expatiate on that just a little bit? More? I can. So, um, again, based on a preliminary modeling, when we're looking at um, since we've not updated the boundaries in 30 years, there are roads that didn't exist 30 years ago. So, um, so when we look at um, just travel times, you, there's a federal repository of travel times to schools. When we look at that, we see that our travel times are very inefficient with the current boundaries. So even if we were to just run a computer model to make our travel times shorter for all schools, it also happens to make our schools more socioeconomically diverse. So that's just kind of an interesting factor that we saw that even not even thinking about socioeconomics, just looking just at travel times, the, the current boundaries have a bunch of inefficiencies, probably just because they've not been updated in so long. Thank you. Any other questions, discussion? Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next, Dr. Paula Wilkins, our Chief Academic Officer, will give us a future ready update um, with the Winston-Salem Forsyth County Schools portrait of a graduate and deeper learning. Good evening, members of the board, Superintendent McManus. This is an update from a journey we started, I think, in April of last year with our first update to the board about the work the state started with Operation Polaris to think about how can we as a state rethink assessment, rethink the skills that we cultivate in our students to help support them with readiness. And so as we have embarked upon this journey, our local branding of Winston-Salem Forsyth County Schools Portrait of a Graduate is all around how we're preparing our students to be future ready. I know you've heard several of us talk about that this evening, and that's just really what we are trying to charge towards as we think about those seven competencies or durable skills we want all of our students pre-k through 12 to exhibit as they work and matriculate through our school district so why the portrait just as some reminders it's all about our collective vision and anchoring what we want for all of our students to align the work and what classrooms look like to prepare them for post-secondary opportunities and thinking about what does our community believe that all students need for success in life as we've thought about this as a, a system and that goal of future ready and to ensure access and opportunity for all of our students, we've thought about three key priorities. And so you've heard deeper learning, you heard that in our uh, board spotlight tonight with the Verizon Lab, with Winston Sound Prep. You've heard it um, in that update that we just heard about fostering diverse schools. But this is all about how do we make our classrooms mirror and um, preparing the life skills to ensure our students are life ready and that the classroom serves as a microcosm for that. Our code of conduct, <laughs> character and support as another priority to support that and then inclusionary practices which we just talked about an update earlier in curriculum committee. This slide notes the top 10 workforce skills for 2025 and these skills are ranked in order thinking about analytical thinking and innovation. 
you think about cultivating that in a student, you don't get that from a lecture. You get that from collaborating with other individuals and thinking about what is available now and how do you rethink and imagine what's possible to thinking about reasoning and problem solving skills and ideation. If you look at these top 10 workforce skills, it's interesting, we've had lots of conversation in various groups that we've worked with over the past um, course of the year. But those four key areas look at problem solving, self-management, working with people, and technology use and development. So if you look at these skills, you might only notice there's only one working with people. When this was released initially, we were in the midst of a thing called a pandemic. So as we look at the skills for 2030, these look just a little different. So we've had an opportunity to help to anchor thinking about reimagining our classrooms to prepare for deeper learning with our leaders and teachers who will help us serve as ambassadors as we continue to work around deeper learning in our classrooms. And so the pictures you see here were earlier this month at the Village Inn in Clemens, where leaders worked with um, another leader from Battelle for Kids, Colin, um, Lewis, who helped us think about the landscape shifts that we need to prepare our students for to be successful, successful in the world. There were spark cards that were um, generated and then around the rooms we looked at those landscape shifts to really talk about how do we anchor and make our classrooms look different. So why the need for these land shape skiffs, land shape skiffs, landscape shifts, I'm gonna try it one more time. <laughs> Third time is a charm. Um, these are really reimagining how we think about core academic content with the skills our students need. So we talk a lot about reading, writing, math, science, social studies, but the shift to deeper learning is really thinking about content mastery, thinking about those durable skills that we have existing in our portrait, like empathy, creative thinking, adaptability, et cetera. So we want to really shift that and how do we use academic content to develop those in our students. And so this is just a quick snapshot. I know you see a lot of words on this page, but let's simplify this. Deeper learning is how do we integrate academic learning with the durable skills we want our students to learn, right? Simple thing, we talk about those soft skills that our students are missing, but we must intentionally cultivate those in classrooms. And that's what deeper learning is about and how do we integrate that with academic content. Those landscape shifts that I just talked about, there were five we explored, which is how will the workforce change? What is the pace that technology changes? How is our global society and economy impacted by changes? Social intelligence, a thing called AI we hear about all the time, and the science of learning, which is kind of like metacognition. How do we learn about how we learn as individuals? So we explored those five shifts during those collab experiences with both teachers and with our leaders. And in addition to that, we had an opportunity to have a site visit with a school system that has been engaged with this work for over six years. Henrico County, got it right, public schools in Virginia, um, mirrors the size of our district, around 50,000 students, similar number size of schools, similar number of um, economically disadvantaged students, and multiple languages and countries represented in their school system. What was unique about seeing their system is to see them six years in, what can we learn on our journey and what things do we wanna to apply to our learning and next steps? And so you will see their simplified framework for learning. You'll see their portrait competencies in the center and then deeper learning as I talked about, they define it as anytime, anywhere, authentic and connected, student owned and then community supported. And that's how they build their curriculum design. That's how they anchor their leadership work. And so it was great to see a lot of the connections throughout their system around their work to implement their portrait. And this was just a snapshot of what folks said about their Henrico um, learner portrait. And so I'd love, I know there were a few board members who visited who might have some highlights and we have one more update. So in addition to that, uh, visit to Henrico, we also had an opportunity to have a deep dive with an organization called Instructional Empowerment. And so if we're gonna shift to deeper learning and think about what classrooms look like, we must reimagine classrooms from being teacher-centered to being student-led. And so we spent a day diving into what does that look like and how does that really even look? 
And so we had leaders, we had from leaders from the district office, principals, to really talk about what are the shifts we need to make and what are the actions we engage in to make that come alive. And so you'll hear a little bit more about instructional empowerment in the next month or so as we engage with them as a collaborative partnership. And then the last thing, so what's next for us, we wanna expand this to more teachers, being able to capture videos and see this student-led work coming to life around building agency where students can take ownership of their learning. That is a part of our goal, one of our strategic plan, and now we need to bring that to life. And so that's what's next for us, to engage over 100 teachers in that learning process with us. How can I help with questions? Any questions? Yes, board member Kuhn. So is it safe to say that, um, I love this by the way, um, but is it safe to say that we will see more um, of the deeper learning with our students um, with the coming school year, that they will be more engaged um, maybe with less Chromebook usage? Like how, like when we think about a timeline, if we're a parent thinking about our students, could you speak to that just a little bit? So I think that's what we're pushing towards. We want to create the conditions where we can have not only examples, but practice labs for our um, educators as well as coaches modeling and providing feedback to leaders in schools. And so I would say we're, we're creating a conspiracy to help to do that in our schools. And the vehicle to do that is through coaching and support as well as continued feedback and then creating repositories of models to show how this comes to life. So that's our work right now. Board Member Watts. No questions, but uh, just again, I was on the visit to the great schools in Virginia, being I'm from Virginia, um, great schools in Virginia. But um, what I also want to emphasize on this project is really we're not doing anything different. We're just going back to the joy of learning and how we can incorporate that into all facets of our education structures and systems in place. So there are some things we need to work on, but again, I want to understand there's really nothing different. It's just maybe going deeper. And also, one thing I really gained from this workshop was it's okay to fail. Mm -hmm. Because when you're trying new things and you're trying different things, it may not give you, quote, the test score that you need, but if you stick with it and design it and plan it well, and engage well, then we will get there. So I just wanna emphasize those points. So I think it's an excellent point. I think what we are trying to focus on is intentionality. What is, what is our end goal? So if we want students to be life ready, I think we hear from students. I don't know how to manage a checkbook, right? I don't know what it means to get a loan. I don't know these practical application skills or even to be able to think about a loan amortization, right? I know most of us didn't think about that until we were getting a mortgage, but we need to expose our students to those opportunities early. And so I think it's the great practice around life that students shouldn't wait till they're adults to get exposure mm -hmm. to. And so we wanna think differently about what that looks like in a classroom and how do we create a continuum. So that is the norm, not the exception. And I also was on that, uh, that great workshop, and, and I want to echo what Board Member Watts said, and when he talked about joy, I did see that, and I saw excitement, and I saw uh, not only, you know, with, this, with the collaboration and the student-centered focus, I saw also student leadership popping through. I just, we are really, I mean, they, we, I think that doing this and going on this path is really going to help um, our kids be life ready. Like, Kind of their focus yeah, as their well. Life ready. We love that. We may steal some of it somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I know. I think we should. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you. One more. Up so, uh, Dr. Wilkins will also, Wilkins will also discuss the 2024 summer care site contracts. So back in, at the end of February, we talked about the request for proposals that was put out and provided recommendations to the board around partnering with our community organizations to support collaborative partnerships with our summer programming. So for summer, we keep going back to joy, joy and exploration in, in enriching experiences to help support learning and to prevent, of course, learning loss and to accelerate opportunities for our students and embed those durable skills that we are pushing around deeper learning and our Winston-Salem Forsyth County portrait of a graduate. 
To do that, we need our partners to help us do that. In addition to the academic learning that we want to engage and enrich our students, we want to keep that enrichment going before after school and um, allowing our community partners to help us with that. So just as a few reminders for summer, um, innovative learning approaches, we're going to have, um, of course, engaging lessons, They're not going to be um, sit and get. We want students moving. We want students active. We want students engaged in taking opportunities to process through academic content. The dates um, for summer will run June the 24th through July 18th, Monday through Thursday, 830 to 4 o'clock. Four-week program with our content summer um, program and certain students based on needs of families will have Friday support with our community partners. So you see the breakdown again of the dates uh, with winston Salem Forsyth County staff and then our before after and Friday care with our community partners. We made a recommendation for five community partners based on the RFQ to contract with for services and we would like to move forward with those contracts which were a part of your board materials. So we have three partners. We'd like to recommend a member memorandum of agreement for before and after care and Friday services, and then two for enrichment services. I'll talk just a little bit of the differences for before and after care. They do the standard of what we do during the school year, and Friday care will be additional field trips, enrichment activities for students by these providers. And then for the enrichment piece, it will be all students that rotate through sites throughout the summer to get access to uh, partner services with a focus on middle school through the cross North partnership and then living rhythms with African drumming for all of our sites. That's all I have. How can I help with questions? Yes, board member Watts. One question on the middle school piece about the rope course. Will every middle school that hosts a site be a part of the cross North experience? So yes, yeah, so we only have two through C for middle school, but both sites will have access and a schedule to participate with the grade levels for the cross North experience. Because okay. again, that's a wonderful experience. Um, students go up 60 feet up in the air and, and hang, I mean, I hang glide, uh, zip line to zip line and build. And up. there will be waivers. Where did Tiago yes, go? Yes. There will be yeah. waivers for families. Plenty of liability <laughs> waivers, like three pages you got to sign. At least. There will be things, yes, absolutely. But I guess one answer, that's, that's a wonderful opportunity for many of our young people who have never experienced that type of experience. It's right here in our backyard, right here in Winston-Salem, Ronaldo Road. It's a wonderful experience. So thank you for adding them to the project. Absolutely. They were um, an excellent partner that we felt a need to expand from just the great experiences we had with students from last summer. Yes, board member Brown Gaither. And I guess my question went around, and I think you probably answered a little bit of it, because I was wanting to know how many students were going to be involved with the cross Nora and for the living, living rhythms, because in the other three projects, we kind of stated. So we're just saying that all the middle schools will have the opportunities for both of them? Correct. So both uh, living rhythms and cross Nora, all, well, Cross North only middle school, all schools for living rhythms. Okay. There are over 2,000, about 2,500. I have to check the official numbers and can send them to Superintendent McManus that are already registered, of which I think we have about almost six or so, 600 or so for middle school. Um, I'll pull the breakdown and share it to okay. make sure it's accurate. So the, the way that this is written, the contract is written, so if we have more, the amount doesn't change. So I guess the question is like, so the, the contract in here is for 82, I think it's 80, 82, $82,500 for 11 days of the, of, at Crossnor. So if we have more students enrolled, the contract, the amount, of, the, it doesn't change, it's just a set amount? So to my understanding, it is a set fee for the services for the days. Now for the other three providers for a Friday before aftercare, that's a per student fee. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a, a sliding scale for our students free reduced lunch and the scale is reflected for that. For students um, who don't need those additional services or who can pay themselves are able to pay directly to the providers. And so this was our kind of transition before when we were able to use additional dollars to pay for all students. This is our transition to help to only focus on our students um, who are eligible for free or reduced meals. Got it. Thank you. I have an additional question. I'm sorry. Yes, board member Brown Gaither. Um, 
the contracts that we see are all stated like March the 11th. I'm assuming that we're going to change that date until after today if we approve it. So that's just the date we entered into the conversation around the contract. Okay. The official contracts won't start until June. Okay. So we, we have not, a, like until approval, we are not officially under contract, but we wanted to go ahead and get started with planning. Because I think there are two dates. There's the one, the, the date that we start the conversations mm -hmm. and we share with the providers and then the actual um, start date, which should say June. We will update that. Okay. Um, the providers received a preview. It's not finalized until we say we're ready to go and we do all the signatures. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Wilkins. Next, Justin Dyson, our Executive Director of Facilities, will discuss the contracted custodial services. Good afternoon, Chair Kaplan, Vice Chair Bohannon, Superintendent Menace. Uh, today I am flanked with Yusef Williams, Director of Custodial and Warehouse Services, to give you an update on contracted custodial services and propose our extension. So really briefly, contract update. Um, we originally contracted 55 sites, 44 schools. Um, that contract had a startup period beginning December 19th, and then we entered into a full year contract beginning January 1, 2023 through December 31st of 2023. Um, we did have some difficulties as we, we, we brought here to the board, um, and we elected to extend that contract for three additional months through March 31st of 2024 of course we're approaching that that um end of term so we're here today to provide that update because we need to renew extend or make other decisions so i'm going to turn it over to yousef he's going to talk through what changes we have seen and um, just give you a general update good evening board uh, chair kaplan vice chair bohannon and uh, superintendent mcmanus and the rest of the board good evening um, the leadership changes uh, uh, with the contract, there was quite a few leadership changes with SSC that helped to, to improve the process of going through. They added a new resident regional manager, an operations manager in November, and they replaced three unit directors who are the uh, individuals directly responsible for supporting their staff in the schools. And they were also in the process of adding a district trainer. We had some supply issues, or they were experiencing supply issues, and they've implemented uh, PAR levels in December. And they trained their lead custodians who are in the buildings on how to manage that inventory. And the unit directors um, go and they assess those PAR levels and work with the leads on maintaining inventory. And as a result of that, the complaints have reduced. SSC is currently running. 11% uh, vacancy rate. The district runs 8%. There is a condition on that 11% because SSC also takes into account their uh, call outs. So if you take that call out rate, uh, people who call off, that's another five to six points that's reduced. So they're, they run kind of similar to what we're running also. One of the things that th we had issues with uh, with SSC and they've done to improve uh, is their principal communication. So the unit directors are, are communicating with principals via email weekly. They are the unit directors, the resident re regional manager, the operations manager. They provide plans of actions for any deficiencies that they find uh, if the principal brings them information or if they see any during their tours. And the unit, unit directors are offering building walks to the building administrators for uh, assistant principals and principals. Uh, and they're, they're also required to visit three times per week. And those three visits are broken up into three purposes. So they will do a client visit, which is speaking with the administration. They also do an operational visit, which is uh, engaging with their staff. And then they do a ass supply assessment visit where they check to see where they are on the supply levels. They've also started implementing their clean intelligent uh, uh, audits. It's a software where the unit directors use it to complete the site audit of the entire school. And they do that during three multiple visits. So the multiple visits compile the report to do the entire audit. Mm -hmm. So by the end of the month, they've completed the entire school and gone through every part of the building.
We've also been vigilant, both SSC and district staff, to try to improve our partnership and communication. And the way we've done that is uh, we've done uh, the custo district custodial staff, the custodial specialists, do a day's time assessments and they collaborate with the unit directors to, to audit the schools. The SSC unit directors themselves are doing focusing on evenings and they are attending our morning meetings, our huddles that we have daily, and we attend their, their uh, staff meetings weekly. But one of the things that the uh, board requested was how were we going to, to monitor the improvements. So what we did was we implemented, uh, we, we chose 12 sites throughout the school, uh, through the district, and we measured cleanliness of, of certain areas. So we picked some things that, based on re reports we're getting from principals, teachers, uh, the areas that we know that needed some attention, and we did a uh, KPI, key performance indicators, and we started measuring the cleanliness of those areas. So we uh, measured bathrooms, water fountains, corridors, um, and we did those weekly for four months. We assigned them a score of one through three. One being that the building, it wasn't touched, that it was dirty. Uh, two, that you could tell that someone did something, but it just wasn't, meet, it, they just kind of pushed things around. It didn't meet the district standard. Mm -hmm. And three, it met our standard, it was clean. We tried to keep it simple. <laughs> Now, what you see here is a graph uh, which you received in your packets. It shows that linear gradient of you know, where we were. You see a lot of reds and yellows in the beginning and moving towards the greens as we started monitoring and making changes in, with their changes they made from November, December, and through, through the entire process. If you notice, there isn't exactly, you know, they aren't con continuously getting better. There are some issues and hiccups in between there but they were addressed real time. Um, if we saw something, we met with SSC, uh, and some of those were explainable. We could tell that there was a time where there was someone who was, who was absent or someone called out uh, on the day that they did the audit. Uh, but those were addressed, and these issues are, these uh, efforts to improve are ongoing. So the district sent out a, uh, a survey to, to all the schools to, to just get their feedback on how they, felt the, how, how they felt the cleanliness of their schools were. And so we sent out one survey back in November, um, and then we followed that survey in February to just see, to see if there was a delta there, see if there was a change. And, and November survey, we only had 192 respondents, and, and, but then when we got into February, we saw, we saw 400. We felt like we, we, we received a better you know, feel of what, what, how things were. 36 schools responded on the second one, only 28 the first. So felt a little better. Five sites had greater than 30 respondents. So those were ones I really looked at as I could actually analyze that data because at that point we saw teachers, a lot of teachers responding and other staff members in the schools and not just uh, principal, AP, lead secretary, you know, those, those kind of staff. We were seeing other people throughout the school. Um, we had an, an average of 11 responses per site, which again, some of those sites had one response, some had a couple, um, but average 11. One of, the, one of the metrics that we looked at was, or one of the questions that we asked in the survey was, have services improved since December? And 42% and of the respondents said yes, services had improved since December. Well, that sounds a little, that's, that's below 50%, so it kind of raises a little flag, but then when we look at what period of time we had to make these changes, it was three months. We basically upended the leadership team, the contract service team did, and, and completely restructured what they were looking at, and they were able to improve 42% of the sites. We felt relatively good about that. Um, the February average level of cleanliness, that scale was one to five instead of one to three as, as Yusuf was using with the KPIs, but um, one being worse, five being best. We were almost at a three. Um, and then 12 of 28 sites responding to both surveys improved in score. I looked at, I looked at those sites that, that responded to both um, a little more in depth. And then there were five sites that actually decreased in score and, 
or communicate, we have communicated those to SSC um, to develop an action plan. Um, based on feedback from the Building and Grounds Committee meeting, uh, we wanted additional feedback, more so than what we received from the survey. So staff are now working to brainstorm and figure out what is the best timing for that to happen and how will we organize that? Where will they occur? Will it be broken into zones throughout the, the district and, and just generally how to do that? So that, that work is in progress, um, but I do not have an update today to say how exactly that's gonna occur. Um, the next thing, SSC kind of committed to us as we started talking about contract extensions, just a, a, a few additional things that we're looking for toward the next nine months. And one of those things is continue those surveys minimally three times a week, as Yusef described, um, and get as granular as they can with those things. One of the other things was, and it's kind of piggybacks off of the survey things we were doing, a lot of times we're, we're only interacting with the administrator at a facility or the custodian at the facility. We're not talking to the teachers because they're engaged in classrooms. And, and I spoke during Building and Grounds about sometimes we like to get into those schools at, at a student arrival time when teachers are out in the hallways and you're able to engage with them and, and get their feedback. So one of the things that SSC is working to do is they're going to log visiting with at least five teachers. Um, and so that so they can get more of that direct feedback from what they're seeing in their classroom when they walk in each morning. Um, and then again, part of the partnership tour, tour at least once per week jointly with our custodial specialist. Um, so their, their, area, their area directors would, would be touring with our area custodial specialists, which kind of work hand in hand. So really quick, the initial contract structure, the base, um, the base annual cost was $9,162,898. Part of that contract was some startup fees that were amortized at $325,035. I got it right this time. <laughs> but that was $65,000 a month. Um, when we extended that contract for an additional three months, for January 1st through March 31st of this year, the base cost went to $636,919.88 per month. Um, and the startup costs were deemed paid in full as part of that contract. Um, there were equipment, equipment costs that were part of that um, top dollar there, and part of those were purchased out as we, wrote, as we moved 10 of those sites in-house. And so those costs rolled off too as we converted um, to come to that 636,919. And so we're here today as staff to recommend extending the current contract for additional nine months um, to take us from April 1st until December 31st. Um, and that total contract expenditure would be nearly $5,732,000 and some change. Um, and we would continue with the current sites that we are contracting. And as Yusuf was detailing, we will continue those assessments and audits of the facilities that we're currently doing and possibly expand them as we, as we feel that we can and, and do well. We want, whatever we do, we want to do it well. And, um, and so we're continuing to, to build that program. And if services do not improve and continue to improve, we'll revisit and decide what are our, what are our alternatives. Um, if they do improve, that, that's a decision that the board can make if we decide to extend. So questions? Uh, board member Kane. Um, I appreciate you guys taking all the feedback and um, comments from the Buildings and Grounds Committee. I just want to make sure that we're really intentional about um, finding the time, um, even if we don't have a plan right away, but to really be intentional about giving us a time when we can do the town hall, um, because I think that that was very important to several board members, and um, I don't want to see that um, um, kind of get lost in the plans of other things. So I would really, again, just like to see us get something really firm on that, um, if we could, please. We could make that happen. Sounds good. We were strategizing about it right before the meeting, actually. So Board Member Watts. So, so the question I have, when we look at this timeline of April 1st through December 31st, 2024, and this current budget cycle that we're planning for 24-25. If we decide at some point to 
in this contract, will money, are we setting aside a potential money to quote, move to in-house or how does that go together or coincide with our current budget and budget conversations if we decide at some point to discontinue the contract and move to total in-house based on conversations about this current budget? Yep, I can answer that because we'll be talking about all of this in our budget right. workshop on Thursday. Any other questions? Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. <coughs> Next, Thomas Krantz, our Chief Financial Officer, will discuss the low wealth supplemental funds for teacher compensation. Low wealth up first? Lottery funds, okay. Excuse me, the lottery. Excuse me. I thought I'd gone crazy. <laughs> Sorry about that. So we, in the lottery process, there's two main categories that lottery funds flow to school systems. One is through DPI in the tune of $13 million to, to this system. And then on the construction side, it flows from us. And historically, the relationship between the school system and the county is that we then have those funds go to the county and the county uses that to, to help with their debt service. At this point in time, we're at that point to adopt. There's a letter that I, I would sign as a CFO, and then there's a board. Re there's a resolution that the superintendent would sign. We're asking tonight for y'all's approval to proceed. It totals out to be three million six hundred seventy-six thousand four hundred sixty-six dollars, broken out six hundred fifty thousand to the thirteen school bond debt and $3,026,466 for the 2015 school bond debt. Yes, board member Kuhn. So this, the, the decision to take this to pay down the bond debt, um, I know that that was made several boards ago. Yes, ma'am. Um, was that a um, kind of a gentleman's agreement? Was it an official agreement? And how, how did that all come to be? And how it appears it that. appears to be as a lot of things are in our district. Um, it was a gentleman's agreement. And but the, the the letters, the resolution, the process has been there year to year to year. But yes, ma'am, I don't find anything that's a firm agreement that's in place. Mr. Kranz, so I, just about what you just said, so you, you said that it appears as if it was a gentleman's agreement. I think the last part of your answer kind of answered this question, but what, what makes you think that it appears to be, like what's, what's sort of behind that? Like is it because it, there's no agreement anywhere? Like you don't have Because the, the letter, I mean, there is no formal agreement. It, you know, it seems like that was an agreement between probably the school board and the county commission at that level. And both boards proceeded in, in, in a uh, honest, truthful manner to reach that agreement on debt service. Now, can you say, Tommy, I want to see a signed document? I can't do that. I can show you the letters and the resolutions it, that have gone through. I can show you the board minutes where they've come through. So it's been a very transparent process but I can't give you a per se agreement. Okay, and so while, while we're sort of on it, so the delineation of the funds, right, the, where the lottery funds go, like the non-instructional support, the public school capital, what, is there a statute or like what, where does the, where do the requirements for the delineation of the funds come from? That's a good question. I couldn't find anything that kind of told me because I was thinking I would see it all going to the county and then the county would do the debt service as they saw fit. And um, they've, they've our, generally our letters when they've had two bond issues that'll be outstanding, they've split it with a smaller amount to the older bond and a bigger amount to the newer, the more recent bond issue. But so that's for just the public school capital, but I'm talking about the like the rest of the funds, like this thirteen million, the one point five. Oh, that like, I would imagine strongly that passes through to us through DPI. That those funds are, you know, when when the state legislature has their budget, 
they give the dollars to DPI, and then in many of the instances, DPI will go through an allotment process, typically like on ADM, to give funds to the school system. So it's a pass-through in our allotment sheet that we get from DPI, and we're on the 50th revision right now for this current fiscal year. Um, those funds are passing through there. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. It's I'm gonna, oh, I, 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 quick question. So with that, that it's paying for AD, you know, maybe through ADM or something like, then it's really not above and beyond. It's really like paying. It, it displaces other tax money. Okay. Yeah, it, it's just a reallocation okay. of right. existing funds. Yeah. Right, it displaces it. With, that's, we don't get 13 additional no, million dollars. No, ma'am. And the, the agreement with the county, I believe, goes back to with the inception of the lottery in 2006. So I believe so, too. It is, it's at least several boards, if not yeah. several more, so yeah. um, that have had this agreement that we're paying down the debt on our capital projects. You know, it is going towards schools, but it just goes to schools that were already built that we're still paying for as opposed to future projects or, yeah. yeah. Well, I think it's important to note that, you know, this is money that we are are getting and not, it is not coming to us to be, I mean, in, in a roundabout way, it is coming to us. and But instead of coming directly to us to be used for facilities, it's paying down bond debt, which is in turn helping the community, correct? To yes, keep from incurring additional tax repercussions, right. correct? So um, we are using lottery funds to benefit the greater good of our tax paying Correct. Citizens, you're, you're, correct. You're, you're minimizing the chance okay. for any kind of property tax increase. You're right. also paying down debt in a quicker time frame so that when the market's in an open position, you're in a better spot to borrow some additional funds. Right. So, I, ju I just wanted to make sure that that was And it's for our clear. school buildings. It's not just general county debt. It's, mm -hmm. it's No, we reference the, specifically the, in, the in all the letters I've seen building, specifically yeah. references a specific school board, school bond debt program. Vice Chair Bohannon. So the last thing I had, and I think this is just a good practice. So I think we've acknowledged that there's no standing agreement in place, but I think we need to have one. So I guess I would recommend that we we kind of engage the county to be able to pass maybe an MOU or something so that we both, both entities understand what the arrangement is and so that we can, even if we are required each year to vote, I still would like it to be beyond just what we continue to be referring to it as, which is a gentleman's agreement. I'll reach out to their CFO and see what we can do. Thank you. Madam Chair, I'm sorry, it's Dion down here. Oh, I'm hey. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to know, to, to Mr. Bohannon's point, just another point, is it appears as though there, there are referendums, and excuse me, um, resolutions going back as far as 2008 from right. the that deal with this um, very thing as far as the lottery proceeds. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Grants, now to discuss the low wealth supplemental funds for teacher okay. compensation. Last year, as you may recall, we received $4.2 million. Those are, these are funds that are specifically for certified teachers, and that's the only source that I can use it for. There's a minimum, a maximum amount that can be distributed to any particular uh, employee, eligible employee. We've always, in my time here, we've done it in a, a straight line method where everybody got the same thing. This year, the amount went up to $5.288 million. I'm requesting y'all's approval to proceed with the issuance of a supplement pay to all certified employees. The actual amount that each employee will get, the gross will be the same because it's a straight line computation. Each employee, since the payment's subject to retirement, it's also subject to FICA, and it's also subject to the income tax, each employee's net amount will vary slightly depending on their tax situation. Any questions? It's me again. Yes. Um, <laughs> so I know that we, um, last year, uh, 
we were able to um, do something for our pre-K. And I know that you have made, you know, it's stated that we cannot do anything. You don't feel comfortable right now doing anything. At, at for, this point in time, I just don't feel comfortable. Right. Now, that, that can change right. as we get toward the end of the year. But, and I wish, maybe I'm just being too conservative. I don't think so, but. Right. I'm just not comfortable at this point to make a recommendation. Right. And I just um, I kind of just wanted to uh, lift that up that it is not um, it is not out of not trying to do what we did last year, but it is trying to be fiscally responsible. And we worked extremely hard to get to the three point nine million last year. Um, I've, I have looked at these numbers and looked and I live with these numbers every single day and night and it was anticipated this was going to be a difficult budget. Um, and I'm, I'm, all the signs that I monitor and the things that I track, I'm just getting a little bit of conflicting signals. So it just makes it me at this point uncomfortable um, or not comfortable enough to make you a recommendation so at this can, time. Can I jump in? And really I apologize. But. So, so. First of all, last year we did we we did not only pre-K, we did it all classified mm -hmm. and right. we we did have other funding sources to be able to do that ESSER or other funding sources to support that we do know that our pre-k teachers are invaluable and are that in are critical to the growth of our students as tommy when one of the conversations we had earlier tonight like right before the meeting started yeah. was as we get closer to the end of the year as we get to uh to, to may and he has a better handle like okay are, where are we going to be? I think the the amount of that, I'll just say I asked, was about a hundred thousand. Right at about one hundred twenty-five thousand. Twenty-five thousand. So we will come back to the board as Tommy under understands end of year financials as we get closer. So it, am I okay to say that, Tommy? Oh yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. That's exactly correct. So we are. I don't want to just say it's not happening. We're, we're going. We will as Tommy's monitoring. Come back to the board. Unfortunately, the full amount with all employees was $3.9 million more, and we absolutely will not have that at the end of the school year. We do not believe I that. haven't foreseen, I haven't yeah. forecast anything like that, so I, I, I think that'd be a challenge. Uh, so how much would it be just for pre-K teachers? About 125000 and that's Total. all in. Okay. That's, that's all in. Okay. For them. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. So now Mr. Grants will also give us an ESSER 2 and ESSER 3 funding update. Come on, Kelly, you were I'm up gonna, here with me. I'm going to say something as Kelly walks up. No, walk up, because they're, they're going to do this. So I wanted to, to start this presentation. I'm going to do it from here, and then they're going to share the whole presentation. Um, but I will say there there is lots out in the, the education uh, world around ESSER and how distri districts are going to do with this um, now that this funding is gone. And I think you're seeing as, as um, many people put money into positions, which we know everyone did, because there's only so many programs and things like that you can buy with $215 million. And so people are really the answer when you're trying to front load supports. And so I think you're, you're seeing in the media what are districts doing at this point? And so I, want, I, wa I do want you to know, and we'll talk about this Thursday as well, is that when we looked at this ESSER, this, this not having ESSER as we move forward, we looked at the entire landscape of our budget. And that, we'll talk about this on Thursday because ESSER allowed us to do more, but when you look at your priorities as a school board and as a school district, other things may change. You may put something else on Title IV or Title II or Title I or something else as you think. That's a priority for the district. So I just wanted to preface that on Thursday, we'll have more conversations about the budget, about your priorities, about um, district priorities, and where some of the funds that may have been used may end up being applied at other places. So, um, But I will say this, as you look at our, our, our finances, um, no one's going to say that we did not spend down these dollars. So um, I'm, I'm excited about that. When we look at the bottom line about what we're saying we have left, um, I'm, I'm really excited because I do know districts also will be judged on, did you use the dollars? How did it impact your recovery? 
and, and getting kids on track. So the end of this school year, our data, this will be, what, three years of having that money, the end of that money. Um, and so seeing how that impact, the impact it had um, is going to be really, really important for us. So with that, very excited. I'm going to turn it back over to Kelly and Tommy to tell you um, how we've spent the money and where we are now. Sure. Thank you so much. Good evening, board members. Um, many parts of the presentation you have seen for numerous years to set the stage. Um, so all of it continues, all of our work is rooted in our mission and our vision. Um, and that's the, the test as budget development as well. So all of our ESSER funds were used to support each strategic plan goal, um, as all of them do address um, and support our families, our students, um, and our instructional staff as well. So as a reminder, our presentation focuses on two um, of the ESSER funds that came through, ESSER 2, which has already expired, and ESSER 3. That equaled $215 million. And so as Mrs. McManus said, we have um, been rapidly implementing strategies and using the funds um, to be in the place to not give any of the funding back to DPI and the US Department of Education, focusing on the areas in which we could use the fund, which was the response to the pandemic. So these um, are activities through March 18th. Um, so it gives you um, as late as we could of an update on um, the, the, the funding um, for the areas. We've kept the same focus areas, um, recruitment, development, and retention of talent. Um, each of these slides as we go through, this, nothing has changed with the strategies. Nothing has been added. We've just, from our last presentation in September, told you what we were gonna be implementing, and that is what we have been doing. And so within this area, you can see that as of mid-March, um, in the area, we have expended um, 72 million just this school year, about 7.3 million, and that is with our ESS contract to ensure that we have individuals in our classrooms every day to support our students in the learning process. Now, these are the slides with many, well, many slides with lots of words. <laughs> and you will then see when we get to the financial part that this is the area with um, large use of our funds. And it was the accelerating learning of students. Um, so you heard from Dr. Wilkins about summer school um, as we continue to use the funds to provide those opportunities for students, all the way through supports for teachers and forms of coaching, professional development, again, to help um, support our instructional staff in meeting the needs of our students. We also supported our parents and families with literacy classes as partners with them. And I'm going to go through these somewhat fast, but I know you have them. And you'll see as of mid-March, we've expended $24.1 million. So when we do look at the amount of the investment in learning for students, um, it is the highest area. Um, this include our digital resources, um, staff, those pieces that just really wrapped arms around students and helping them through the learning recovery process. In the areas of social, emotional, behavior, and mental health supports for students, um, this has included our school counselors, social workers, our school nurses, CARES teams, all those components um, which assisted and continue to assist our students. Um, where we know that there were challenges, um, not just in remote learning, but also through the return to school and in those subsequent school years. You can see as of mid-March, a little over $4 million expended in this area. Then our operations and facilities. Um, this was for air quality. We knew how the virus was transmitted and is transmitted. And it is our lowest amount because most of the work has been completed. And so you can see by mid-March, it was just about um, $740,000 there. And then with all of the work is the evaluation of the work. And this is coming into play with what Mrs. McManus said too in terms of what strategies um, did we have great benefit and what would then move into, we're looking for funding to continue those works. So the, the, these evaluations are continuing. Um, our extended learning programs with our schools, which included strategic tutoring and also enrichment activities. 
um, graduation coaches, literacy coaches, our interventionists, and SEL coaches. So on the evaluation side, it is the smallest. The other one was the almost smallest, but this and right about $70,000 to date for paying for those evaluation services. So overall, sorry, pressed it too far. Overall, you can see where we are um, as of mid-month. We began this school year with a little over $44 million, and as of mid-March, right about $7 million is remaining for the last few months of school. Vice Chair Bohannon. So going back to the slide about evaluating the ESSER funded initiative, so out of those, these six bullet points that are on this slide, how much of the total amount that if, you've added, if you add up all of these, the amount of money, how much do these services account for, for the total amount for ESSER, that we spent from ESSER 2 and ESSER 3? I'm looking at, I'm seeing yeah. if I can do mental math. Mm -hmm. And I have too many numbers in my head, yeah. so could I get back to you yeah, sure. on that one? Oh, and, and, <laughs> you have and, positions in there. Um, I, know in, I, know, I know because I just looked at a report from Mr. Krantz, our extended learning programs that allocated over $3 million to our schools. But the other ones are positions, and so I'd like to be able to go back and confirm. Sure, I, and, and it's okay. Like, I don't need an answer this evening, but I think that just the general, the reason why I asked the question is because I, like these are the things that sort of we've talked about that we sort of focused on however I think to the for the community and for me it's important I know we had to sort of pick and choose which programs were evaluated but I I would love to be able to have some idea that it if that this I, I hope that this accounts for at least a significant amount of the money that we've spent over the course of the past few years given the fact that the evaluation pieces and sort of what really worked, I think is it's important just for me to know that we've, it's good to know that we've spent the money, but it'd be great to know that we spent the money wisely and on things that actually yielded good results. So I think one of the things to think about is this is not the only, these are not the only um, activities where there's evaluation being done. This, is, this would be the formal evaluations, um, where Mr. Kraft contracts with an outside um, evaluator um, so to, to look at these. Part of that, and we talked about this early on, is making an investment and also collecting data so that if we find that one of these um, strategies produced results that we liked, it also gives us data which gives us opportunity to write grants because now you have success, how do we replicate it, how do we expand it? I will say that on a continuous basis at numerous levels um, of the district, data is being reviewed. It could be usage data. So there was a, a large amount of money used for digital resources. Um, one, we didn't know how long we would be in remote learning, but then also providing students access to learning materials, um, even if they're in school, but use it at home as well. So there's, our, there's additional evaluation going on, not as a, in a formal, formal aspect with some contracted service help that way. Um, so I hope that helps in saying it's not a one and done what we see, we see there. The other piece is Mrs. McManus spoke to this about how well we use the funds, but also the results we receive. That's part of our application to the state in each um, of our rounds of ESSER funding. There is an evaluation component. Um, so even with air quality, how did we measure that putting money towards in, in improving air quality? Well, that's our attendance. That was rate of infection. Um, so there was a measure of evaluation in all of the components that we do have in ESSER. Okay, thank you. Board Member Kuhn. I'm gonna kind of piggy up, uh, piggyback on um, Vice Chair Bohannon. And I think I've been um, pondering this as a question, but um, when he said that, it, it really triggered that I wanted to ask it. But um, social work was um, something that was really big, and um, it doesn't, does it fall under one of these that was formally um, actually, uh, I guess, evaluated or or was it not evaluated it, it is not in, in the list of a formal okay. evaluation however we know the work of social workers of counselors 
do come into play, and we have data um, that can support that. Our panorama data, the work that our social workers, counselors engage in, it does impact. So there are some measures. It may not be a direct measure, but they are a contributing factor to where we see in our data. Also, our attendance data, which is one of our measures, the work that our social workers do to connect families um, early on in the pandemic in terms of basic needs to be met, and as we move through the challenges counselors working with that, social workers. So not a formal evaluation, but definitely data points through the, throughout the years to be able to determine, is this something to continue? And those are conversations in budget development time as well, looking, this may have been an ESSER funded strategy that we expanded um, in, in the level of priority, where does it fall and what data can defend, if you will, a request of whatever position or program it may be. Question. Um, yes. Where are we with uh, inventories of items that we know we will no longer be using? I mean, I think about some of the ESSER purchases um, you know, that we made. How are, are we accounting for those? We're following federal requirements for inventory. So in, the, in terms of our Chromebooks, in terms of devices, um, I can let Kevin speak to that, but I know that they are following, um, they're using a management system. It's checked in. We, we determined, is can we continue using those devices? If not, we move through the process of, is it broken? Is it lost? We, we go through all of that. Um, in terms of school level purchases, say with their ELP funds, if they purchase items that needed to be inventoried because they were considered walkables, they can go in a book bag or a pocket and walk away, or they have a lifespan longer than a year, um, our media coordinators are putting in part of Destiny inventory, mm -hmm. and there has to be an annual piece um, of making sure that the items are still in the school. And then in terms of when they're doing that inventory, it becomes if, an, if items are damaged and cannot be used, then we do a disposition process for that. Um, if it's something that we just don't want anymore, mm -hmm. <laughs> If it's something that we don't want and it still has value, then there's a process we go through depending upon the funding source. So it's offered to other schools, it's offered to departments, and then eventually you get to a point of moving on to next stages. Um, then that becomes complicated of auction, then you gotta pay money and the whole thing. So but we were also, I believe, very conscious of purchases. Are these long-term purchases, are they short-term, more of a consumable, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, board member Watts. And I may have missed this, I apologize. So when we're looking at literacy coaches or MTSS interventionists, we say we're evaluate. We'll, we'll see the, the data that, from the evaluation at some point on whether they're working or not, or is that part of our budget discussion on Thursday? It, it is not. Those roles, the, the, the graduation coaches, literally literacy coaches, MTSS, all of those are now options in our Title I plan that schools can purchase, and we actually used... Um, uh, we are using like off the top dollars to give our Title I schools a flexible position where they can choose one of those. So many through the allotment process have made those decisions to purchase those positions. Um, so it's not something we're asking for on local dollars. Schools can purchase them, but we, I am happy to share the, the evaluations. I'm not sure if there was, Andy, and you can maybe answer this. Some of those I looked at like right after the first year, like early in implementation, are we doing like this year follow-up implementations? Before I share them with the board or can I share them as we have them now? I think I may have shared a couple already actually earlier when we first got them. Yeah, that's right. So there's evaluations of how well we implemented and there will be a summative evaluation that will occur in the end of this school year. And so you can have those already if, if you yeah. don't already have yeah. the, the implementation evaluations and then you'll get the summative evaluation this summer. And the reason I was asking the question, because if they are really impactful mm -hmm. and we're moving into a budget process, I mean, just for example, graduation coaches, if they've really made a difference in every high school, perhaps that could be a discussion we could have on Thursday as budget priorities. I'm just trying to align my priorities with impact. That, yeah. that will be as we do Thursday. The, I mean, and it's only, I wish that it was a, like a three or four hour meeting. It's a 90 minute meeting. We may, we may need to do part two, um, but the goal will be you're gonna see the, the like kind of the picture about what you know departments, what we've kind of, what we've prioritized. You all are then going to, to spend time talking about what you want to actually have us actually do, eliminate, 
that like your voice is going to be important on that day. So if you like, we're going to talk about where we are through the allotment process a little bit through social workers, um, which of these positions have been requested. We also, before we actually made decisions with our restructuring, we actually spoke with principals as well about impact, not of people, but of positions. Because you cannot fund, we can't keep funding everything that we have funded. It would be literally, we just would not have the funds to do that. So we would have to be asking you know, for 30, 40 million more from our, our county, that, that would not work. Um, so we will, all that will become very apparent as well on Thursday. But again, positions that are site-based, that are really, when you're a principal and you can say, I've got Title I dollars, and Literacy Coach has been that key, or MTSS has been that key, you're able to purchase that with your, with your Title I funds. So. Any additional questions? Okay, thank you very much. So we will now move on to our action items. The first one, consider approval for the finance to appropriate the enhanced stop arm grant funding. Do I have a motion? So, so moved. moved. Second. Okay, so I have a motion by board member Kuhn, a second by board member Miller. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor. Thank you, that is unanimous. Next, consider approval of the contracts for summer providers. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. I, so I have a motion by board member Barr, a second by board member Crowley. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Opposed? Sorry. Oh, sorry, we're passing the paper. Okay. Passing the list. Oh, okay. So that approved. passes approved. unanimously. Thank you. Next, consider approval of the contracted custodial services briefed at the March 12th, 2024 Building and Grounds Committee. Do I have a motion? Moved. Moved to approve. Do I have a second? Second. <laughs> so I have a motion by board member Crowley, a second by board member Miller. Any further discussion? Some tongue tied there. I'm sorry? Oh, okay. Um, hearing none, all in favor? So we have four, three? We have no, four no. in favor. One, two, three, four, five, six in favor. Opposed? So we have three opposed. Motion passes six to three. Next, consider approval of, for the CFO to issue the letter and school board resolution to the county commissioners regarding lottery funds. Do I have a motion? Move to approve. Do I have a second? Second. So I have a motion by Board Member Crowley, a second by Vice Chair Bohannon. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Thank you, that passes unanimously. Next, consider approval to proceed with the disbursement of the state provided low wealth supplemental funds for teacher compensation to all eligible certified employees. Do I have a motion? So move. Do I have a second? So I have a motion by Board Member Miller, a second by Board Member Brown Gaither. Any discussion? Uh, yes, I'd just like yes. to make sure that we exhaust all possibilities either through um, uh, foundations or asking the county to try to um, give that supplement to our other employees. To the others, okay. Thank you, any, any other discussion? Okay, so we've had a motion and a second. Mm -hmm. Discussion, all in favor? Thank you, that is unanimous. Next, consider the approval of the disposition of the surplus mobile modulars at East Forsyth High School. Do I have a motion? Move to approve. Do I have second. A sec okay, we have a motion by Board Member Crowley, a second by Board Member Watts. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Thank you, that is unanimous. Next, consider approval of the schematic design for Ashley Elementary briefed in the March 12th 2024 Buildings and Grounds Committee. Do I have a motion? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. So I have a motion by Board Member Barr, a second by Board Member Crowley. Any discussion? Um, I just wanted to comment on that, that, that the actual build was projected to be around $40 million for uh, the new Ashley. So um, I just think that number needs to be out there so that the public's aware of, of how much a new elementary school does cost. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, so we have a motion and we have a second. All in favor? Thank you, that is unanimous. 
Next, consider approval of the multi-year field leases briefed at the December 12th, 2023 Building and Grounds Committee. Do I have a motion? Move to approve. Do I have a second? Second. So I have a motion by Board Member Crowley, a second by Board Member Barr, I mean, excuse me, Board Member Watts. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Thank you, that is unanimous. Next, consider approval of the proposed revisions to the board policy 4115 assignment, transfer, and promotion of personnel briefed in the March 12, 2024 policy committee. Do I have a motion? Move to approve. Do I have a second? So I have a motion by board member Miller, a second by board member Brown Gaither. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Thank you, that is unanimous. Next, consider the approval of the proposed revisions to policy 3513, the energy management conversation, conversation briefed in March 12, 2024 policy committee. Do I have a motion? Move to approve. Do I have a second? Second. So I have a, a motion by board member Crowley, a second by board member Kuhn. Any discussion? Just a comment, please keep in mind as we move to the new calendar, that we need to make sure that air conditioning is working in August effectively and efficiently. Amen. Here, here. <laughs> Thank you. Any, <coughs> any other? Okay, so we have a motion and a second, and we've heard discussion or comments. All in favor? Thank you, that's unanimous. Next, consider the approval of the mental health crisis response policy briefed in March 12th. 2024 policy committee. Do I have a motion? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. So I have a motion by board member Barr, a second by board member Kuhn. Any discussion? Yes, I just, I wanted to make sure. Dion, did we, I didn't get a chance to take a look at it. Did we restructure it and make it look like it was great? I'm good. Good, thank you. Any further comments or discussion? Okay, thank you. All in favor? Thank you, that is unanimous. And that completes our action items for tonight. So our next order of business is the superintendent's update. Thank you. So you heard a little about, a bit about this, um, but Saturday we had a career fair and thank you to our HR staff, all of our building leaders and everyone that was there to support. Um, I met many candidates that are wanting to come into our school district. We had about 478 interested, 341 attended. It was more than the 330 that I thought, um, which was about a 71% attendance rate that day. And so we will come back to you with how many we actually hire from that day as soon as the hiring process uh, continues. So that was a great, great um, career fair. Um, next, Panorama, March 28th is the deadline. I wanted to give a little um, uh, share where we are with completion rates at this point because we're still pushing to the 28th, and if we need to, when we get back from spring break, extend for a week, we will do that, um, because it's very important that we have these all of these rates up. So you can see our family response rate right now, about 4,571 parents, um, which again, still low, so we're gonna continue to do many different strategies to keep increasing that rate. Staff response rate is 3,764. Now these are site-based teachers and staff. When we have about, um, I asked Chris how many, about 5,200. So it's about 72% right now of staff that have filled that. We, again, it's completely anonymous and we don't attach it to the person anymore. So it's harder to email them directly if they haven't done it. It's just, we have to just continue to send reminders out. And then the student response rate is about at 69.4%. So again, we've got a few days left, well, two days left actually, till the 28th. So we'll keep reminding, and again, if we need to extend for one more week, we can do that after spring break. Working condition survey, also very important for us. I saw on a, a, a state um, um, newsletter that it, the, day, the deadline was extended to April 5th at 5 p.m. Our goal minimum, we need to be at least 50% for that data to really um, show that, you know, 50% of a staff says this about working conditions. That is a minimum. And so we've got nine schools with less than that right now. I'm starting down there because the, the top numbers are, are actually really good, but nine with less than 50%, we'll keep working on those. 48 have 75% or greater, which is really great. So almost half of our schools have that many responses from, from teachers. And then 72% are at 50% or greater. So again, 
all getting up to, to that greater than 75% would be great. We're going to continue working on that till that April 5th deadline, which will be during our spring break. So we will keep pushing that through this week um, and, and keep, keep increasing those rates. All right. Early start. This Thursday is also when we want anybody that has a, a pre-planned unavoidable conflict that we describe to our families. We've continued to send reminders out about this. The deadline for turning in and that information um, is also on the 28th. So spring break is coming. We know that um, and March 29th is, is a, a holiday. It's I guess it's, it's considered spring break because it's Friday before it's considered spring part of spring break. Um, but basically, all early, early and middle college will still be in school. Um, they've already had their spring break. So we'll do March 29th to April 8th, even though March 29th will be a day off for early middle college too. And I think April 8th might be, I'm not sure. But anyway, that is, there is our spring break. Teachers and staff do come back on the 8th. So students do not, but teachers and staff do come back on the 8th. Um, so I wish everyone a very uh, relaxing, restful, peaceful, and very happy spring break. Thank you. Uh, do any board members have any comments or questions to the superintendent? Okay, thank you. So our next order of business is the consent agenda. Consider approval of the general personnel report and consider approval of the February 27, 2024 Board of Education meeting minutes. Do I have a motion to approve both consent agenda items? Do I have, okay, so I have a motion by Vice Chair Bohan and a second by Board Member Crowley. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor. Thank you, that is unanimous. Our next order of business is announcements. Tuesday, April 16th will be our next regular meeting of the Board of Education. Before we begin our section of public comments, um, let me say to our cable TV viewers, thank you for watching. This will conclude our broadcast. Thank you for joining us on Your School Channel, Cable 2.